you know, looking at this charged ring, show that the electric field at point Z is equal to, and they gave you the resulting equation. Your job was to use first principles to show that that was true, which is what we were doing yesterday. But they gave you the answer to which you were searching. So, you know, that kind of helped. It helped give you a starting point, but more importantly, it also made it clear that if you're going to have to reuse that later in the problem, you didn't have to go in there blind, you had the answer. Now they do that quite a bit nowadays, where they will have a step in the problem where they will ask you to prove something, but they will tell you what your target answer is going to be. So you're not shooting in the dark. Older exams, you were just shooting in the dark, and if you couldn't get that answer and it was used in the next step, you really were kind of kind of lost. So yesterday, we ended, I think, right at the point where we were showing the answer. Is that true? So we had the piece of the electric field equal to, and we had to go through the whole um, finding out what the linear density was, and we were basing that on R d theta times k, and that was um, all over... My recollection is z squared plus r squared times z over uh, z squared plus r squared to the one half. Is that right? That's where we ended. And our charge density was q over 2 pi r. That good? So. We have to integrate this to find the answer, but the best part about this is remember, when you're doing an integral, this becomes the important variable to look at, theta. So when we look at everything in that relationship, anything that is related to theta has to be a part of our, our um, integral. In the case of this problem, theta is measured from here to here, because it was this d theta we were talking about. So there's actually two thetas in this problem. So let me be clear to make sure that we don't get them confused, because I wasn't on the board yesterday. Let's call this something different, phi. That angle was the angle the ring, a piece of the ring made with the horizontal, while theta is the angle on the ring that we were using as our integral variable to sum up every piece of the ring. So two different angles were mentioned. I didn't differentiate between them in your notes. So everything you see there in red in that equation is a constant. None of that changes as we go around the ring, which means when I go to integrate this, the truth is the only thing that I have to integrate is d theta with one big constant in front of it. Do you see what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to simplify the, the, the problem, to take all that alphabet soup out of the way and help you realize that your electric field is really just based on the sum of the circle, that every piece of that circle contributes the same amount and contributes in the same direction. So all I have to worry about is integrating around the circle, summing up all the pieces of area. So if I want to get the entire electric field I just need to make sure I sum from 0 to 2 pi. Again, the calculus still might be something you're not comfortable doing. We, you've never done this, and you definitely haven't done it in your calculus class yet, unless you've already had calculus. You guys aren't doing integrals. But if I'm taking the antiderivative of d theta, it's just theta. That's not so bad. So my answer ends up being that big constant times theta evaluated from 2 pi, I'm sorry, from 0 to 2 pi, which is just going to be that big constant times 2 pi. Yep? That C is just everything else besides d theta? Yeah, it's everything that's in red there because not one of those things is related to theta. Okay. Now, if one of those things was related to theta, I'd have to have it in my integral part. Like when we had the line of charge yesterday. Most of it was constants, but we had cosine squared theta. We had to integrate, you know, integrate it from, from negative pi to pi over 2 to pi over 2. We'd have to find the antiderivative of that because that was part of my function. 
The, the reason why we don't have it here, and I think this is an important, important piece I keep trying to throw out there because you can see it in the symmetry, is if I look at this ring, every portion of this ring is the same distance away from this blue point that I have here. And if we remember, the electric field from a point charge is only based on two properties, the size of the charge and how far away it is. So it's a uniform charge density, so every one of these pieces has the same charge. And every one of them is the same distance away, the same R away. Yes, sir? We're using 0 to 2 pi here because we are picking a single place on the ring from which to start, and we're going to go all the way around the ring. Now that's why we're doing 2 pi here. In the prior example, with the so going back here, I want to grab all those constants now and drop it into the answer. So all those constants are lambda r k z all over z squared plus r squared to the 3 halves power times 2 pi. That's the electric field. Now, come on, that looks like a hot mess. But let's try and make a little sense of it. Believe it or not, there's quite a bit that we can do to make sense of this. And let me get to a new page for that, okay? So E equals lambda R K Z over R squared plus Z squared to the three halves times two pi, but lambda is Q over two pi R. So let's let's put work Q back into it. We were just using lambda as a placeholder in this problem. Our problem actually gave us Q to start with, so we should have Q in our answer. So Q times 2 pi R K Z. I'm just kind of combining the 2 pi and the R together, putting the KZ there, and lambda is where the Q is, but we have 2 pi R under the Q, and we still have R squared plus Z squared to the 3 halves power. I hope the first thing you notice is that the geometry of the ring disappears. Now, it's not that the size of the ring didn't matter, but the geometry of the ring did disappear. And this is because the ring itself creates pieces of charge that are all the same distance away. So the fact that they're arranged in a circle, that actually is the definition of a circle anyways the locus of points equidistant away from a given point. That's why its geometry didn't really matter. It just mattered to let us know that they were all the same distance away. We add them all up, we get the entire amount of charge. So all the charge contributes. That, that doesn't surprise me. Now, there are a few things here that do surprise me. I'm gonna put the QK by itself, but I'm gonna separate out this Z over r squared plus z squared to the 3 halves. This part is the part that tells me the size of the electric field based on z, how far away I am from the ring. When z is 0, we expected the electric field to be 0. Is all of this 0 when z is 0? Yeah, yeah, the numerator is 0. Now, we expected the ring to look like a point charge when R was small compared to Z. So when Z is much greater than R, under those conditions, it's like R going to zero, which leaves Z over Z squared to the 3 halves power. Do you guys see what I'm, what's happening here? Z squared to the 3 halves power is Z cubed. So this is Z over Z cubed, which is 1 over Z squared. I get back 
the exact same thing we see in Coulomb's law, where, remember, the electric field from a point charge is based on your distance squared. So, this is not the first time we've seen this function. Do you remember? It was exactly the same thing when we had two point charges in space. We had the exact same answer. The only difference is that rather it be the radius, it was the distance apart of the two charges. So this shows up in stuff like this because we know we have to have this weird dependence, this idea that the electric field is zero when I'm inside the ring at the middle, and it tapers off in the long distance just like it would if I was just a point charge, it's in the middle that it does something interesting. And this is what was on your multiple choice test. Do you remember? The one multiple choice test we had, you had to pick a graph that would look like this. And the graph that I wanted to remind you is going to look something like that. Now, in a couple of weeks, I will expect you to be able to tell me when the electric field is a maximum. In a couple of weeks, you should know how to do that. So from here, I want to remind you that maximum and minimum come from the derivative. That's only been asked once on all the AP exams that I've ever seen. But look, sometimes it's not about the AP exam. It's about knowing what your mathematics can tell you. Okay? All right. Of charge. And this is an excellent question, so I do want to at least spend a moment. I have this infinite line of charge, and I am located, you know, here. Well, I want to go from, you know, this side and sweep all the way around to, you know, this side. And we were measuring our angle from here. So in the extreme, this would be, you know, pi over 2. And if that's a negative side, it'd be negative pi over 2. And we're going to go all the way from there to pi over 2 on this side. That would be infinity. You know, in the extreme, that angle goes to 90 degrees. Does that make sense? So when you're choosing your limits is actually almost an art form of itself. Because in the case of this problem, you know, I would probably actually do zero to pi over two and then just double my answer. Because I get equal contribution from both sides. You know, I would try and find a way to simplify it. Anytime you can work a zero, I think, into your, into your um, limits, you're gonna have an easier time of your work. So finding those zeros, I think, is important. Is that all right? Take this lightly. E and M can actually be broken down to four equations. Four equations that govern all of electrodynamics. And those equations are called Maxwell's equations. Everything else we've seen or will see is a derivative of Maxwell's equations. And Maxwell's equations are incredibly elegant. In fact, that's a t-shirt by itself. But it's already been done. A list of Maxwell's equations and what part of this do you not understand? Because, quite frankly, Maxwell's equations just look really, really cool. Now, I'm saying that to you guys, but looking cool is one thing. Some of you are not impressed by an equation, and I get that. Maxwell, though, is, is a neat guy. When you look at his history, he was just a horrible human being. He, was, he had his hand in all sorts of stuff, and him and Faraday and a few others really, really were just mixing it up. And they would just, they really wanted to break new ground and discover new things. And it was almost always at the expense of the health of their lab assistants, whom more than once suffered catastrophic failure in the laboratory. So when you study these guys, you know, we, we tend to revere them as science heroes, but Science usually has breakthroughs at the expense of somebody else. Uh, Faraday is, is actually famously known for trying to get to absolute zero. 
That's, that's not what we will study about Faraday, but it was one of his passions. And the pursuit of absolute zero was actually being taken up by several different scientists. And they were all trying to get to colder and colder temperatures, trying to get as close to absolute zero as possible. And the only way to do it is to cool something that's already under pressure and then release the pressure. So they would make these incredibly complicated glass tubes and they would put a gas in there and they'd put it under pressure as much as they possible when cold to liquefy it, and then cool it even further as a liquid. And then they would make the pressure drop as close to zero as possible, which would force the gas to vaporize, sucking all available heat with it, lowering the temperatures even further. These guys were getting down into the, you know, tens of Kelvin. But they were doing so by demonstrating that they could liquefy helium or liquefy neon. The noble gases is what they're trying to liquefy because it's hard to do. More than once, their tempered glassware would explode in the laboratory. They were never in the lab, at least not when that was going on. They were behind the protective barriers, but they always needed somebody in there to pull the plug and lower the pressure. TA has often paid the penalty for that, with glassware exploding in their face and stuff, not infrequently. I used to show a movie about it, but I don't anymore because it's really, really boring. But maybe I'll see if I can find at least that part where they're talking about the pursuit when they're really getting to the low temperatures. Now, today we're gonna to talk about the first of Maxwell's equations, Gauss's law. And Gauss's law is the most bizarre law that there is. It is really, truly bizarre. And I say most bizarre, and I'm gonna say that a lot this year because each one of these is actually pretty bizarre. But between all of these, I like Gauss's law a lot in that all of these are laws. And who can tell me what makes something a law? There's no theory to explain Gauss's law, but there's no evidence to the contrary. So I'm gonna tell you what Gauss's law is, and I'm gonna write out Gauss's law, but understand it doesn't really mean much to you guys right now. Gauss's law states this, that the charge enclosed in any, um, in, in any, oh, enclosed in any complete area is equal to the total electric flux times a constant. Now, the word complete is still wrong. Bounded, that's the word I wanted to use, a bounded area. I knew I would not be able to go on until I got the right word in my head. So the charge enclosed in any complete bounded area is equal to a constant times the flux. Now, this is the symbology we're going to use. This circle with a line through it actually looks like that when drawn correctly. Nobody draws it like that. They all draw it like this. But I want to make sure you understand that the actual symbol used for flux looks like that. It's like an I with a circle in the middle. It will be the symbol we use for flux. Flux is a general term that comes from the Greek word to flow. But there are lots of different kinds of flux. The, you probably have not, who's used the word before and not accidentally because you meant to say something else? Okay, so I can say anything at this point and it really wouldn't matter. But when we talk about flux, Flux is always related to the flow or the capture of some value through an area. Now, that doesn't sound like very much, but here's, here's an example that in Florida you might understand. Who has ever seen somebody skim a pool? Like you have a pool in your backyard and you have to skim it? How many of you know what I'm talking about? You've got that net on the end of a stick. Okay. And you're gonna take it across the water so that you can scoop out anything that's floating on the surface. Does that make sense? So 
if this is the water's surface and you grab your net and you place your net like this, the water surface, and here's the pole. So you're holding it right above the water surface and going across. We would say there is a water flux passing through this portion of the net. Does that make sense? Because that water's going through the net in that area. I would never, if I was trying to skim the water, I probably would not put the net in like this and draw the net sideways to the water because I wouldn't capture anything. If I wanted to capture something floating in the water, I would like to open the net up in such a way that water passes through the net. Does that make sense? Flux is a measure of the amount of water going through the net. Now, skimming a pool, I don't care how much water goes through the net because I'm just trying to capture stuff that's on the surface, right? But if I was actually trying to scoop water, this would not be the most efficient way to do so. It would probably be better for me to get more of the net in the water. Wouldn't you guys agree? Because now I would have all of this water flux passing through the net. Are we following a little bit about the idea of flux right now? So when we talk about flux, the most common way it gets brought up in Florida is solar flux. People who work in the area of solar power attempt to place solar panels in such a way as they get the most sun exposure, which means placing the panels perpendicular to the rays of the sun. Does that make, you guys can believe that, right? So we wanna try and find a place where we can do that. Now that's impossible by the way, because the earth being flat and the sun moving over the top of us, we know the sun is never always perpendicular to the solar panels. And if you believe in a round earth or a spherical earth even, you understand that the sun is never in the same place every day relative to those solar panels. So you try and maximize the efficiency of your panels by placing them at some angle where the sun usually hits it dead on. But solar flux would be looking at rays of the sun, which might be coming in in nice, you know, straight lines. how they might be striking our solar panel, and that has to be the end for the day.